Good morning, Ian. Yep. Morning. So, how's it past there? Well, I'll tell you in a minute. Hopefully, looking good. Back together. Yep. Um, clearly, obviously, when you pull something in bits and rebuild it all, there's probably going to be something somewhere. Yeah. Work somewhere. Right. But until we know what it is, we can't fix it. Yeah. yeah exactly. So, <laughs> so yeah. I'm expecting us to start trying to fire it up out there, and then yeah. it'll either start up and it will shoot down. Or Do you fire it when it's on the track fully, as it were? Or yeah. Yeah. So we're pulling yeah. the track. Yeah. Because we have a limited amount of time we can run the engine, um, and also because of the uh, heat out there. Is that the, uh, the, the amount of cooling on the engine lasts for probably 20 25 minutes. So, um, so, as we tend to, so is that a liquid cooling? Yeah, yeah, so we're pumping it around oh, right. and cooling it. So, literally, okay. Because yeah, so, obviously, the engine is designed to be the environment, you know, it's not designed to do this. Yeah. So certain modifications have been made to the car to make right. it work. Um, and some of those are, yeah, to be fair, actually, it'll probably all right. It's cooler today, but when, when you're out there and it's really hot in the desert, you know, it's how long you can run it for. And these are the famous wheels that are the fastest rotating object, man made object, isn't it? So. Amazing. Are they aluminium? Sorry? Are they aluminium? Yeah, it's aluminium, yes. Yeah, it's 7000 series, aren't they? And they like self healing as well, which is quite nice. So you can see when they get a dink in them, yeah. what you find is you get a dink in it, it will stand up proud, and then when it goes back on the desert, it, the sand of the desert actually rubs it back yeah. down again. The finest part so of the sand. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. There's a reason why sandpaper's made with sand, and yeah. that's what the floor's made out yeah. of out there. Yeah, exactly. It's perfect for yeah. cleaning up the wheels. Yeah. Was that self-healing something that was planned, or it just yeah. is that way? I think it's just a bonus, really, to be honest with you. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't involved in the design in the first place, but, and everybody talked and worried about wheels for many, many years, yeah. but until you have to get out there and use them, you've no idea what's going to happen. So that's what the whole project's about, what the testing's about, is making yeah. sure that we actually find out what it's actually going to do rather than just talking and thinking about it for years, you know? Yeah, sure. <laughs> and that's where the rocket engine would get mounted as and when? Uh, yeah, literally bolts on the back of that. Yeah. And that, what, that plate comes off behind it and then... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there'll, there'll be a pipe that goes yeah. out and feeds the back of the rocket. Amazing. And the nozzle of the rocket sit just forward of the uh, jet right. Is there any steering done with the tail fin at all, or is it no, all no. just just just, no, no. just full wheels? Right, it's a five degree. Do you think this is ironic? Because <laughs> <laughs> big jet nozzles. There any kind of clue? Yeah. Yeah. Jet well, health and safety. <laughs> right. Okay, so we're basically uh, at the uh, control centre of the uh, the operation. So these yellow containers that are behind me, sponsored by MTN, but that's uh, if you like where they do the operations or like you know, track control. So there's a lady called Jess who's based in there. So looking out from the from the view from there, we've got uh, the tent. This is obviously the main operation centre, and the uh, main workshops are in there. The cars are there at the moment. Uh, inside the tent, close to us, there's a briefing room. Uh, they've got their own power generators, air conditioning, lighting, all that sort of thing. Um, if we go pan around to the right hand side, we can see the actual the, the pan where they're doing the testing. Um, if we go look straight ahead, um, we can see uh, entry entry way to, this, uh, to a road that leads onto the pan. There's some yellow markers in the distance, and that gets you onto actual test track. Obviously, uh, access that's quite restricted. They don't want cars um, jumping all over the place and uh, leaving uh, what they call FOD uh, for an object damage. So anything that could get sucked into the engine, anything you know, it could be a, a wrapper from a bag of crisps, anything like that, or of course bigger stuff uh, could get whipped up into the jet engine, which of course is not not a desirable thing. Um, it's truly an amazing, amazing spot. Um, we've got, you know, fantastic space. I think the track is about 350 meters uh, wide either side. It was like 700 meters wide, so it's 350 meters either either side, in case there's any issues. And then it obviously runs down the middle. The track is about 16 miles long in total. My name is Dr. Ben Evans. I work. Uh as an academic at Swansea University, I'm an associate professor in aerospace engineering and I've been responsible for all the computer modelling that underlies the aerodynamic design of Bloodhound. Yeah, so the starting point really, I mean, and this is going back 12 years now, going back to 2007, the starting point is what kind of propulsion system are we going to need in a car of this size? That gives you your rough sizings of the overall car, how long it's going to be, what kind of mass it's going to have. Um, from that point then you can start thinking about okay, aerodynamically what shape does this need to be? So we've used a tool called computational fluid dynamics, or CFD, which is basically virtual wind tunnel testing, um, as the design of the car has evolved to constantly update our predictions on well, what's the, the aerodynamic drag on the car going to be at the various speeds it will experience, and importantly, what kind of vertical load, downforce or lift will the car experience, because of course we need to keep this thing on the ground. 
When you're driving, I mean, anything at high speed, you want to make sure you're directionally stable. I mean, in simple terms, I mean, what Andy Green often refers to is he wants the pointy end always pointing forwards. Uh, and that demand has led to the sizing of the fin that we have on Bloodhound. Um, so aerodynamicists talk about a thing called the static margin, which basically is a measure of how directionally stable the vehicle is. How, do, how much does it naturally want to go in a straight line? The downside of having a vehicle that's too directionally stable is that it becomes crosswind sensitive. So one of the, one of the things we've been exploring during the high speed tests of Bloodhound is how crosswind sensitive is Bloodhound? How, um, how large can we allow the crosswinds that the car experiences to be before we say, no, we need to stop, we can't run the car today? Yeah, so, so we have these series of wind sensors positioned along the track at two kilometer intervals. Uh, which are constantly updating us with the local wind speeds because you know on a track of 16 kilometers long at the north end the wind could be doing something quite different to what it's doing at the south end and we need to know in pretty much real time what that wind is doing to make a decision on can we safely run the car now so the the early runs that we did we tried to establish what our crosswind limit is at the moment we're setting that at around about 10 miles per hour so before we run we can check the data we're getting from all those sensors check whether it sits within that crosswind limit we have and it's data from those sensors that helps us make the decision about yes or no can we run the car. The wind is you know critical aerodynamically and kind of stability wise what we're finding is at this time of year I mean it's November now so it's hot season we're finding very early in the morning if we can get out onto the pan by six in the morning it's pretty good uh, so we did a run this morning and it was fairly still conditions but by mid-morning, and certainly into the afternoon, we quickly go over those crosswind limits and, and, and the conditions become quite gusty, which is even worse than you know, just a steady crosswind. So what we're looking at at the moment is, um, aerodynamically, we're trying to understand as best as we can to what, to what extent the real car in the real world is behaving like the theoretical, the CFD model of the car. Um, so we've got almost 200 pressure sensors over the surface of the vehicle, um, measuring the pressures in real time, we get all that data back and we can run comparisons of, well, what we, were we predicting the pressure should be at that point on the car compared to what are we actually measuring? And that, that helps us build up our kind of confidence map, if you like, of how safe it is to run the car even faster. Good. Well, thanks so much indeed and, and good luck and, and see you again. Pleasure. Thank you very much. My name is Pete Carney. I'm from Digital Caspold. We're out in the Kalahari at the moment. We're with the Bloodhound team. Um, they've been running the car at various, uh, various high-speed tests and... This is the second day I've been out here. They, of course, have been running the car for 14 days or so, and they're getting progressively faster and faster. Um, the aim of today was to essentially run the car up to 550 miles per hour. Um, this morning, we woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning. We traveled from the hotel to here to get here at 4.30. The sun was coming up. It was nice and cool. Everything was set up, um, but the, the engine wouldn't start. Um, after some diagnosis, they decided to tow the car back to base. Um, there was a, a faulty connection, simple as that. They fixed that towed the car out again, and at around, was it sort of maybe 11, 11.30, we saw the car run up to 330 miles an hour. There was a plan to run at 5.50, but it was so hot and a little bit windy, so Andy Green, the driver, decided to essentially um, wait until tomorrow morning again. The entire operation here is paid for by an individual. He's paid, I think, 60 million pounds, so he's 16 million pounds, to, um, to run the program and, and, and take the car forward to these high-speed testing. Um, any day that they are not running the car, they're losing data, they're losing time, it's costing him money. And, you know, unlike many companies where you've got, you know, a team of engineers who might be able to solve problems here, there's like, well, there's one systems guy, there's one, engi there's one mechanical engineer, there's one sensor guy. So it, it really, um, the responsibility lays on someone's head and it's costing real money. So the, the pressure to get the, the car out there is, is immense, but they, they all came together, made good, and it's fantastic. It, it, was, it, it ran today. Yeah, there's a guy called Whisper. Um, He's, I think he does many other things, but he's, when I've met him, he's been essentially the, the lead marshal. So he's been out um, along the track. It's really important when the car runs that nothing gets sucked into the engine. So at every two kilometers, they have a marshal, a pair of binoculars looking out for wildlife, any debris, plant matter, anything that might get blown, up, blown out of someone's pocket onto the track. They take it incredibly seriously because, of course, the driver, Andy Green, his, in, his life depends on everything working well. So, um, so Whisper's a great guy. He's been uh, kind of the lead marshal, um, and he's, he's stood with me on a couple of times on, on, one of, on I think, kilometre 8 and kilometre 10, and he's a, he's a great guy. I think he's called Whisper because he's, he's quite a quite quiet guy. When Bloodhound announced they were going to do these test runs, they actually made the announcement from the capital main offices in, in London. And I think that was a result, uh, I think Nick, one of, our, um, one of our commercial team, one of the best commercial team guys, or let's just say Nick, our commercial team, otherwise I'll be biased, you see, that's unfair. 
Um, but he's a great guy, very tall. Um, essentially, um, Nick offered them or persuaded them to make their press announcement from our offices. Uh, and I work in a team at Catapult who are responsible for you know, product innovation, who build stuff. And rarely do I have the opportunity to go to the, own, the events that we run. But I thought, you know, hell, you know, this is a, a UK engineering company aiming to go faster than the speed of sound, yeah. doing amazing stuff. I've got to, got to go and listen in. Innovation at the edge. Yeah. So essentially, I, w I went upstairs um, and, and sat in the back and they made the press announcement, some really good questions. Um, and Andy Green was there, the driver, and I think the uh, financial guy, and, and some of the, um, the head, of, head of operations, head of engineering. And I hung around at the end and, and struck up a conversation with Andy. And you know, my, my son, who's 11, is a great fan of anything that's fast and electronic and this sort of thing. So he's been watching Bloodhound develop over the years. And Bloodhound have made, a, an e made their efforts to, um, to exhibit at, sh at shows that kids would be at. So I said to Anthony, you know, my son's a good fan, you know, and, and what do you think about when you're driving? And he says, you know, it goes, he says the car goes really fast and, you know, crosswinds are really important. And so at that point, the Caspal already had a product which we'd built for our other, for the Army actually, Army and Navy and Air Force. And um, our product, our solution, is a, a LoRaWAN-based um, tracking asset monitoring solution that does actually everything but wind speed. It did, you know, right. temperature, humidity, pressure shock. So we thought, okay, um, Wind speed shouldn't be too difficult to, to add. And, um, and so I had a chat to our CEO and said, can we offer this to them? And they said, we can, but we need, some, we need a partner to put some money in to pay for some of the sensors. And of course, you know, the obvious choice was, was AWS. Um, why AWS? Because first of all, they're a company that we know and respect and use a lot. Um, we've, you know, pretty much all of our platforms are built on AWS tech. We also know a certain Wayne Suter, who, um, who used to work at the Caspot, has now gone to the dark side. So we made contact with him and, uh, and said, look, you know, can you, can you collaborate with us on this project to turn this idea, the wind speed sensing in the Kalahari, into reality? And uh, I'm very glad to say they did. There's a, a track that runs down through this, this uh, hack skiing pan. It's called the, the hack skiing pan is probably 25 kilometers across. But the track that they're using is, is 17 um, kilometers long. It's been um, totally cleared of stones by the local community over the last years. And they've laid out this track, which is marked out every day. It's completely flat, it's completely level, there's no stones on it. And every two kilometers, they have a, a marker. And at every marker point, where they also have a marshal, they've installed a, um, a wind sensor. So a, they actually have two sensors. There's a wind sensor that does wind speed um, in terms of gust and average speed, wind direction. And there's another sensor which measures uh, temperature, humidity, and pressure. Now, the, the thing which they're most interested in is, is actually the wind speed. I mean, the car, when it goes full, full speed, it's gone up to, I think, 501 miles an hour so far over the last few weeks. Any crosswind, which will blow it off course, affects the performance, the, the, the way the driver has to react, potentially the safety. So they are using this data for, for that. If the wind speed is above 12 miles per hour, per hour, they will not run the car. And so they're looking at the dashboard. The dashboard we see here, um, we've got a, a row for every sensor, and that has the various parameters as columns and they'll be looking at this, they can set alarms and thresholds, and if, if a, a sensor alerts, then they have to make the judgment call as to whether they would like to run, and if there's a full alarm, they'll probably say, we're gonna wait, wait and see what happens. Because I said, you know, the, the sensors are a few hundred pounds, this car's 16 million, you know, so they, they wanna take care of it. Um, so that's, that's what they're using it for. I think um, the, the secondary aspect is temperature. Um, the engine, the jet engine performs um, better when the air is cool, because the air is dense, so if it's super hot out there, I think today at the moment we're up to 37 degrees. If it's above 40, the performance of the engine um, will be affected. Now that's not necessarily important right now, today, but when they're going for the full record a year from now, they'll want to be, you know, get every second, every, every ounce of information that they can to decide when to make the run, because they'll only have a few attempts at that. Fantastic. And when we're on the, uh, on the, the, the pan today and the, yeah. the, they kind of ended the run, it was really interesting hearing Andy talk a lot about the wind. And as you mentioned earlier, the, in fact, the, this afternoon session was called off because of the wind. And so they, you know, they're using this data yeah. all the time. It's absolutely you know, critical to, yeah, it's key to the... It is indeed. I mean, this, 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 this you could say is an aircraft, really. I mean, all the effort is keeping on the ground. Um, you know, it, it's, 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 a, it's an aircraft without wings. It's got a jet engine... Um, super high speed, so they need to make absolutely sure that there's no possibility of it flipping or the back lifting up. I was talking to a guy in the car on the way when we were driving out to the pan, he was saying one of the effects that can happen when they go supersonic is lots of things invert, aerodynamic effects invert, which can tend to lift the back of the car off. 
off the ground. And I think that he said that that was called wheelbarrowing because, of course, you've got a very unstable car with the rear wheels off the ground and the front doing all this sort of thing. It can, it can easily turn and do erratic stuff. We do not want that to happen. So you know, wind speed will be absolutely critical, and they're going to look at that. And, and we got some fantastic feedback from, um, from Martin Roper, who's the sort of, uh, lead operations guy, and he was saying, you know, ne next year they gave us a bunch of features we should add. They're all super easy things to add to do. Um, they'll, they'll need those for, for the next year. So there's a bit of development work, but not more than a couple of weeks' worth, and then they would use it again, I think. Absolutely fantastic. Well, well done, and uh, thank you for, for getting this project on the way. It's been a pleasure. It's been a great working with Amazon. Um, I think they've uh, met all of our exceeded all expectations and will continue to be a great partner of the Casbol. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Wayne Suter. I, I work for Amazon Web Services um, and we engaged with Digital Catapult, um, a, a kind of a company that we work quite closely with and we uh, kind of managed to get involved in the project with an organisation called Bloodhound which is they try to set the British land speed record mm. and uh, we're out here today to uh, have a look at what they're doing. So they, uh, up to recently, they in fact hit 501 miles an hour, uh, which is what their target was. So they've achieved their target. Uh, this morning, uh, they got up really early to try and catch the, when, when the, the air is a little thicker um, and, and cooler um, to run the engine. The engine runs better when it's the kind of denser air. Uh, but they had a problem starting the vehicle first thing this morning. So they in fact postponed it. Uh, brought the vehicle back in, uh, made modifications, took it back out shortly before lunchtime, and luckily we were on site at the time. And we were able to go out with the team onto the pan um, and and watch a, you know watch a kind of a speed attempt. Today's was not a high speed attempt. Well, I mean it was incredibly high speed, but not uh, not uh, they weren't trying to kind of beat the previous uh, uh, speed uh, that they'd set, which was 501 so far in their trials. Uh, today was about testing some of the the uh, air stops. Um, so they've got kind of fins that come out the back of the, the, the vehicle and slow the vehicle down uh, to kind of brake it, air brakes. Um, and so they were testing that today. So they only got up to 320 miles an hour, which was unimaginable to see this thing flying past us on the pan, throwing up dust. It was really spectacular. They, they were going to do two runs today, and the second one they have decided to put on hold because of the, the wind data that they were managed to collect. So in running a, a vehicle at that speed, side wind, uh, Andy Green, the driver, was in fact uh, giving an interview, and I was, I was, I was listening in on that. And he was explaining that the side wind you know, can call the vehicle to jar you know, fairly severely at those kind of speeds. And so uh, being able to have the you know, wind below 10 miles an hour, I think, was, was the limit, um, is absolutely critical. And so being able to, they realized and worked with Digital Catapult, and, and a guy called Peter Carney uh, came up with this idea to be able to support this project by putting you know, Internet of Things uh, sensors across the pan, you know, cut, cover, kind of scatter them across the pan, and by doing so, we can monitor the wind uh, kind of coming across the pan towards the the kind of test area. And so, um, so this morning they were able to you know, instantly see that uh, after the first run, the wind had picked up because the middle of the day it gets hotter. There's a lot of convection, and they postponed the second the test run because of that data. So it's that that wind speed data is playing a key part in in their testing regime. Yeah, and I, and I think I understand that the uh, the sensors use a kind of rather wonderful technology called LoRaWAN. Could you explain what that is a little bit? Yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating technology. It's, it's a connectivity technology that's designed specifically for this kind of Internet of Things uh, uh, kind of space. And so it's incredible in that it's got amazing range. So we've got a single gateway outside this building, literally uh, outside this window over here, and we can see across the entire pan. And looking across, I can barely see the other side. And so a single gateway can cover you know, many kilometers um, of range. Uh, you know, the gateways are reasonably inexpensive, and the sensors are reasonably inexpensive. So quite quickly, it allows you to put in place infrastructure that, uh, that, uh, and kind of de deploy infrastructure really quickly that's incredibly useful. And, and that's the beauty of IoT. Mm. Uh, one last question. I heard that Martin Roper, who spoke to us earlier, was saying that they had got some other solution, but, but this one was better. Um, do you have any ideas you know, what, what makes this sort of catapult straight AWS solution really good? Yeah, I think you know, the Digital Catapult's got a, a number of years of experience in, in working and deploying um, uh, LoRaWAN and, and IoT solutions into, into real customers and helping them kind of prove out business cases in, in their particular environments, whether it's you know, in the Navy and the Army and, and kind of other, 
other kind of quite demanding, demanding customers. And, and this bloodhound you know, is, is no different. Here we're in, it's 37 degrees outside, there's dust everywhere. And, and you know, Digital Catapult was able to you know, conceive of what the, what the infrastructure was, help set it up, you know, put in place the bits, and then also build the back end. And, and the back end, the reporting platform that the, Martin was showing us here earlier, um, that they're using you know, on a minute by minute basis, literally while they're doing their trial, you know, while they're preparing the, the vehicle, um, the, you know, it runs on AWS. And so it's, you know, it's, it's robust, you know, they can scale it up if they need to, um, but it's, you know, with AWS's IoT infrastructure, it just makes it really quick and really easy to be able to build, build applications quickly that are scalable and robust and, and secure because, you can, you know, it's a very, very wide area. You know, it's important that these devices get secure so that when the data lands here, it's trustworthy. Really well, thank, thank you very much. I think you've answered all my questions fantastically. Well, I wish you a, a pleasant day. Um, stay out of the sun. I think it's... Uh, it's very hot out there and very dusty and it's kind of pretty much uh, hottest time of the day, so enjoy a cold, well-deserved beer, I think. Thank you so much.